these things come. And here's what I read you now. This is the uh, Bay Bay series, the Kittens uh, series that Hayum has written. And this is my reading in uh, Chinese. It comes with, with simplified, it comes with traditional, and fortunately for me, it also comes with pinyin at the back, okay? <laughs> Which I find very helpful. Uh, these are nice stories about uh, little kittens. You get to know the kittens, their personalities. There isn't much there for beginning Chinese readers. It's really sad, and this is really one of the uh, few really high quality, in my opinion. I'm talking about my teacher, okay, so don't believe anything I say. I really like these books. These are very, very good. Uh, moving on, this is from Alina Flesco, a colleague of ours, who's a TPRS Spanish teacher, and this is the availability of materials in Spanish of really good readers. The foreign language profession in the United States has done a terrible job in supplying reading material for beginning students. Horrible. They haven't even tried. The only group that's done anything is TPRS. Karen Rowan is one of the outstanding TPRS authors. There are a few more who've done some really good reading. And that has been my foundation in Spanish. That's how I got moving in Spanish, by reading all these nice, easy readers from our colleagues. We have them in Spanish, some in French, some in German, uh, some now in Chinese. Not nearly enough in any. I am constantly encouraging TPRS teachers to do more, do more, do more. Get more readers out, get free readers out. Or, uh, we're, uh, like our project, we're trying to get uh, stories in Chinese to classes all over the world, written by students, all of these things. We need lots, lots more. English as a foreign language has done very well. It's called graded readers, and all the companies have pretty good selections of graded readers. This is what's holding us back now. TPRS has led the way. They're the ones who really took this seriously. But we need more, we need more. I want our kids, our students, in all foreign languages, to be able to go home right from the first semester and read for pleasure for 30 minutes a night and have a wide variety to choose from. Different topics, just like we can do it in our native language. Right, that's the goal. So these uh, slides that you've seen are a very, very good start. Uh, you can check out Ignite Language uh, for the not just the blog, but also uh, information about our projects to get more reading for, for children or for beginning students involved. That's a wonderful resource. Okay, we're now up to this page. This is my mini presentation on reading. I want to switch now to writing. Here's some interesting claims. If you write more, you will not become a better writer. We do not learn to write by writing. We learn to write by reading. Famous American author said, read a thousand books and your words will flow like water. That is exactly what happens. Our style in writing, our ability to write with a good introduction, conclusions, and good topic sentences, all that is absorbed, is acquired by reading. It's the only place it can come. The writing system is simply too complicated to learn one rule at a time, etc. This is where it comes from. Writing does something else, something different. Some of you, writing right now and that's a good idea the chances are very good no one is going to read what you're now writing probably not even you <laughs> but it helps doesn't it writing takes ideas that are vague that are abstract you put them down on the page they become concrete you can work with them you can come up with better ideas. Writing helps thinking. Writing helps problem solving. Writing makes you smarter. That's what it does. I want to give you some research showing this is true. I'm not going to go through the experimental research. It's, it's pretty good, but pretty boring, too. I want to show you some more interesting research. First of all, 
Smart people, write a lot. Smart people produce, and it's in the writing that they get smarter and smarter. We have some very interesting data on eminent scientists and eminent musicians. Uh, how many publications do you think Albert Einstein published in his career? Any ideas? 248. Most people say three, five, none. No, he worked hard. In fact, in Hans Ohanian's uh, biography of Einstein, he has this one section. It's a book called Einstein's Mistakes. It's a great book. And it's about science and how you have made mistakes and you solve them. You make mistakes and you solve them, etc. Einstein would write a paper in a professional physics journal. And then a year later, he would write another paper on the same topic and say, last year's paper was wrong. Here's this year. Then the next year, he would write another paper in the same journal, say, last year's paper was wrong. He did this like four years in a row. And each time, struggling, making progress, going through this messy process of revision, reevaluation, et cetera. Well, I got some more numbers for you up on the scorecard here. Here's some other people. Charles Darwin, evolution. 119 papers. Sigmund Freud, 330 publications. It's the writing that made them smarter. And as their career moved forward, they got smarter and smarter. Uh, Beethoven, 722 musical compositions. Mozart, nearly 600. In fact, by the time Mozart was my age, He'd been dead for 35 years. Okay, that's <laughs> A little bit more about Einstein, some more Einstein gossip, okay? Einstein's a great case. People say, well, all his great work was done when he was young. You heard this? When he was a young man, he got everything right. And when he got old, he, he was just an old fool. He never caught on. He never understood quantum mechanics. And the world left him behind. No. Here's the career of Einstein. In 1909, Einstein came out with what's called the Special Theory of Relativity. In one issue of the Journal of Physics, he published three papers. One was relativity, another one was on the photoelectric effect. Is light a particle or a wave? And the answer is yes, it depends if it's low. Uh, and that won him a Nobel Prize. And that established it. He was a young man, he was 26, and that established it. 20 years later, he published the general theory of relativity. One of his critics, <clears throat> Niels Bohr, said that the general theory of relativity <clears throat> was a huge advance over the special theory, as big an advance as special was compared to Isaac Newton's physics. So when Einstein was in his 40s, he was doing better work. Now, we all know that when he was in his 70s, he came to the United States, he worked at the Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies, and they say, Einstein failed. He tried to come up with a general theory that combined all the forces, uh, you know, magnetism, electricity, uh, gravity, all at once, and failed. And he never understood quantum mechanics. Not at all. He was trying harder problems. He was trying to put everything together in one coherent super theory. He published on it. He wrote the papers. They have never been properly evaluated, in my opinion. The fad went to quantum mechanics. Could very well be right. But Einstein was dismissed because fashion changed, which is very dangerous, I think, for science to do this. But there's no evidence that Einstein got any dumber as he got the growth, as he matured. He probably got a lot better. I have a friend who uh, suffered from the same thing. Uh, my best friend in graduate school was a guy named Larry Hyman, who eventually uh, who's made his career when he was a first year graduate student, 21 years old. Can you imagine? I was 27, Larry was 21. And he was doing his last year of undergraduate, his first year of graduate together, one of those. He was so good that nobody was jealous. We all admired him and said, Larry, oh my gosh. He did a paper his first year that eventually he published that turned the field of linguistics upside down. It was so amazing in all the big journals, etc. And people now, Larry says when he meets people, they remember that first paper. And 
that's all. It's like having one hit song that you recorded when you were 23, and then nobody wants to hear the new stuff. But his work since then has improved, 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 improved. The original work was so different and so remarkably fresh that it got old for the But these people continue to improve as they get older. So it's the work itself. My point is it's the writing. The writing itself over years and years. Look at the Beatles. You're familiar with their career? The Beatles performed more music and wrote more music than any other rock group. The top 10 tunes uh, in the 1970s, five would be Beatles. Okay? They were always, and it was the playing, the practicing, and the writing of new songs that kept them improving, kept them going. So writing itself makes you smarter. Okay, other evidence. This is not scientific, but I find this wonderful. <clears throat> a letter to the, to the uh, Chicago newspaper, to Ann Landers. Ann Landers is an, was an advice columnist. Uh, you know who these people are. People write in with their problems. You know, uh, my husband doesn't understand me. He won't take out the garbage. What should I do? And here's one letter written to Ann Landers in 1983. It goes like this. Dear Ann, should I marry the guy or not? Let me tell you what the problem is. He's 31. He behaves as if he were 14. He can't hold a job. He's borrowed money from me three times in the last year. My parents don't like him. And he's jealous. When he brings me home at night after a date, he calls me up again 15 minutes later. He says he just wants to say goodnight one more time. I know he's jealous. He thinks I'm going out with someone else and he's checking up. One night I was in the shower. I didn't hear the telephone. I got up the next morning. He was asleep on the front porch. Now the good things. He's very good looking. I find him physically attractive. That's about all. <laughs> I've been sitting here for 10 minutes with pen in hand and I can't think of another good thing to say about him. Don't bother answering this letter. You've helped me more than you can imagine. Got it? Okay, this is how it works. You write it down. You have a personal problem, and we've all had problems. You have a diary. We've all done this. You write it down, at least 10% of the problem goes away just by writing it down. Sometimes the whole thing. Okay, this is how writing makes you smarter, helps you solve problems. I find that, that the best evidence ever. Well, uh, one of the victories of the field of language arts, English language arts, major contribution in the 1970s, the field of language arts came up with something called the composing process. Very good stuff, and this has helped me enormously. The composing process are strategies that good writers use to solve problems, make themselves smarter, and avoid writer's block. I'm gonna give you four components of the composing process. We'll call that the classical composing process, and I'm gonna add two more that I think should join the program. The major one, revision. Good writers know that as you go from draft to draft, you come up with better ideas. Average writers and poor writers don't know this. They think that revision is just making a neater version of the first draft, making sure it looks better. They don't realize what Peter Elbow said, brilliant scholar in writing. In writing, meaning is not what you start out with, but what you end up with. I'm gonna repeat that, because that's helpful. Meaning is not what you start out with, but what you end up with. Kurt Vonnegut is a wonderful source of these things. Kurt Vonnegut says that he has to write things down or he has nothing to say. When he's interviewed, uh, he never can come up with anything. The way he does interviews is the way I do. I ask them to send me the questions, or if they don't have questions, I write the questions and the answers. That's how I do it. And then I can think about it. I don't like to do interviews just face to face because I never have anything to say. Uh, Vonnegut said that he was invited to do a radio show in New York, was it, sorry, a TV show, one of these discussion 
He said he was on the show twice. He never said anything. And they invited him back again and again. He says, I have nothing to say unless I can write it down, go over it, revise, et cetera, et cetera. Revision is the answer. This is how it happens. I will now quote Ernest Hemingway. And what I'm about to say is Ernest Hemingway's words, not mine. Got that? Okay. Ernest Hemingway said, the first draft of anything is shit. Believe me, this is a real breakthrough. This is the cure for writer's block. Realize that the first draft isn't going to be any good. That takes the pressure off. The work in writing is revision. Writers say most of their work is revision, going back over and over and again. In fact, I am now so psychologically healthy when I write, having read all this research, that when I have to revise, I'm happy because it means I'm learning something new. I don't worry about the first draft. It's always mediocre. As I go from draft to draft, I have better ideas all the time. Trust the process. Okay, that's number one, revision, and I think that's the core idea. Uh, number two, plan. You have to have a map before you go off on a trip, but the plan has to be flexible. Be willing to change your plan because revision makes you smarter. If you have a plan in the beginning and you start writing, you're gonna change your mind. Writing makes you smarter. You're gonna have new ideas. You have to change the outline and start all over, over and over. And Peter Elbow says the best thing you can do when you're two thirds through with, the, with your composition or you have a draft, do the outline all over again. And you'll see how much you have learned since you started writing. I take a lot of long distance flights. I remember one flight I was taking to Korea. I was on my way to deliver a paper, and the paper was already written, I had it all done. And I was just gonna relax on the airplane. And uh, the guy next to me, oh my, he looked like he was on his way to a convention of chainsaw killers that he had just escaped from jail. You know, this kind of guy, he's got the t-shirt and the tattoos, and you know, he looked like a killer, so I, I, I pretended to be very nasty. <laughs> I knew you did, yeah, okay, yes. Uh, then he fell asleep. He fell asleep on my shoulder. <laughs> no, no, so what do you do? And while he was sleeping, he was saying all these ugly things. No, you're not gonna get me. No, I'll die as I'll get this, I'll kill you. So I got him. Now in all these flights, long distance flights, there's a place in the middle where there are little snacks. And there's a little, so I took my computer and I went to the place. Now my paper was finished. I decided to re-outline my paper. And I took my time because I didn't want to go back to the seat. Okay? I said, I stood there for about two, three hours re-outlining the paper. I thought I was done. I wasn't done. I found so many new connections that I had discovered that were in my subconscious, ready to come out, you know, that I discovered through writing. It was wonderful. So not only did I re-outline it, I rewrote it. And I came back to my seat feeling pretty good. I thought he was awake, but uh, okay. So you get the crazy person on the flight next to you, get up and redo your paper. <laughs> So have flexible outlines, be willing to change them. Uh, number three, reread. <clears throat> Hemingway did this. Uh, Maya Angelou did this. They would always reread what they did the day before, before they started to write. <laughs> this is wonderful. You know, you don't want to do that. I'm in a hurry. I got to get this done. I got a deadline. So let me start writing right away. No, reread it. You will save so much time. And you will see what your subconscious mind has been producing for you. Always a wonderful idea, and it eliminates writer's block. A major cause of writer's block is losing your, your place. You don't know where you are. You've got this big ball of string, right? You can't find the end, uh, that kind of stuff. Reread what you wrote the day before. The good writers do it. It is, it is magic. Number four is universal advice. Come 
comes from uh, many people. My favorite version of it is Peter Elbow. They all say, don't worry about cosmetics when you're writing. Don't worry about grammar, spelling, or punctuation. There are very, very good reasons for this. One reason is, if you're worried about punctuation and spelling, you're not worried about your ideas. You'll lose track of your ideas. Focus on the ideas. We're revising for meaning. Also, the draft you're working on now will not be your final draft. It's not the final version. You're going to revise it. So why make it beautiful if it's not the final version? Do you put on your makeup before you take your shower? No. I don't. <laughs> okay? So you shouldn't either. It's a waste of time. Same thing. Wait till you're done. Elbow says, when you're writing, pretend that you've hired an editor. And the editor is going to come and do all the fine points, the grammar, the spelling, the punctuation. Then, of course, you hire yourself and you take care of it. Beautiful. Well, I've just given you the uh, four components of the classical composing process. And again, as I told you, they've been extremely important to me. I, I did a workshop at the same conference as uh, Peter Elbow two years ago. And it was so nice to meet him and thank him for all his work that helped me in, in my writing. As good as these are, though, I think we can add a couple more. Uh, do you remember when you were in the fourth grade and you were doing some work in class, okay, you were doing some stuff, and suddenly you found yourself staring at the ceiling? And the teacher looked at you and said, Karen, is the answer on the ceiling? Remember that? It happens all the time. Everybody will always do that. Well, if you want to give the clever answer, you can say yes. The answer's on the ceiling. Really, what we need when we're writing, thinking, trying to solve problems, is to stop and the word is incubate. Magic word, incubation. This was discovered, this idea, by a psychologist named Graham Wallace, W-A-L-L-A-S. His book was published in 1926, called The Art of Thought. And his insight is based on the work of the physicist, observations of the physicist. The physicist says, when I get stuck in my work and I can't solve a problem, I go for a walk. And then all the solutions come to me as I'm walking. They never come when I'm at my desk. They never come when I'm tired. And from this, this was Helmholtz, world famous physicist. Yeah, uh, but what Wallace saw, uh, speculative was we need a moment of quiet, of non-thought, of empty mind, a kind of a meditative state to allow the answers to our problems to come. There was a big scandal in uh, biology a few years ago with the discovery of the double helix. This was Watson and Crick who won the Nobel Prize for it. James Watson wrote this brilliant book uh, called DNA, how they came up with you know, the spiral thing. Here's how they did it, and people were just horrified when he announced this. This is their idea of scandal. He was wondering what the final diagram would look like. They couldn't figure it out. He went to the movies with his wife. When the movie was over, they were walking back to their car in the parking lot, and suddenly, the answer came. He didn't get it in the laboratory through hard work and struggle. He got it when he was relaxed. All these people talk about this Einstein and his boat and his violin. And people always took breaks. Uh, my favorite person here is uh, a French mathematician named Poincaré. Poincaré lived about 100 years ago, and his work was extremely important for Einstein, for the theory of relativity. And he wrote an article on creativity that is reproduced in every collection I he says, when I'm working on my mathematics and I get stuck, I get up, I do something automatic and ordinary. I put some wood on the fire. I put something away. I come back maybe in a minute or less. And the problem sometimes is completely solved. Or at least I get a new idea as to how to solve it. 
Han Kare has changed my life. I want to tell you what he's done for me and what he can do for you. Let me tell you what I do in hotel rooms. The secret life of Steve Krashen in hotel rooms. Okay. When I check into a hotel, I'm in the room maybe 10 seconds, and an evil spirit comes over me, like a poltergeist. And within a minute, all of my stuff is spread out in the room. Does this happen to you? My toothpaste is on top of the television set. My socks are in the shop. I don't know how they got there. It's like this spirit came and just threw everything around. And the room is a disaster. Well, I gotta clean it up, you know, because the lady comes in to clean it up and I don't want to be embarrassed. Right? You do that too? In case I have to do a little bit of straightening up. And it's it's a mess. I, I hate the idea of unpacking. I hate the idea of cleaning up. I even hate the idea of getting dressed in the morning. It's so boring. So Plan Carre has saved me. Here's what I do. When I go into a hotel room, I usually have a lot of work to do. So, you know, I have uh, trying to write a letter to the editor, trying to finish an article, do some footnotes, do a statistical analysis, all of which I really like doing, believe it or not. So I open up the computer, I start to work, I start to write. After one minute, I get a writer's block. I have writer's block all day long. My life is a series of writer's blocks, of problems I can't solve. So I hit the first block, I get up, take the toothpaste from on top of the television set and put it in the bathroom. Then I go back to work. 45 seconds later, another writer's block. I open my suitcase, I take out one shirt, and I hang it up. That's all. My goal is never to clean up the room and unpack. My goal is to get my work done. And these things are breaks that allow me to incubate. Mm -hmm. At home, I don't cook. I hate cooking. I do the dishes. I can take a 20-minute job of dishwashing, and I can get it done in two and a half hours. <laughs> I bring the computer into the kitchen. Every, if people say, can I help you? And it's coming, no, leave me alone. And I do my work. Wash three dishes, dry and put away two. Three, two, until you reach the halfway point, and then it's dry, three, wash, two. And I don't keep track, I don't worry how much I have left to do. I'm doing my work, and before I know it, the kitchen is clean, and my work is done. So Plan Carré has given me this incredible gift of how to do the unnecessary, or the exhausting, boring labor of life that we all have to do. I did this this morning. I think the editors are on 10 o'clock. You guys are in the middle over there. I was trying, I had to write some things. I had to write two notes, two letters to the editor, revise this, things just had to be done. But during that time, I actually managed to get dressed, and shower, and each little thing was a break from the work. Isn't that magic? This is use these tasks for your incubation. We don't allow incubation. We don't allow kids to take a little break even walk around, but we all use it for ourselves. I need to take breaks. Every paragraph I need to take breaks. Uh, finally, LSD is a term some of you know from the drug culture, but it really means long, slow distance. I want to talk about the Olympics a little bit long, slow distance, and how runners train. And then a brilliant insight from a professor of counseling in New York State that has also helped me a great deal. Uh, we're gonna be uh, into the marathon pretty soon, you know, the 26-mile run, which is always one of the most interesting parts of the Olympics. I found an article about two years ago about how marathon, marathon runners train. They run long distances in their training, but you know what? They run slowly. They don't run as in training as fast as they do in the race. They run a lot slower. This was introduced in the United States by a distance runner named Frank Shorter. Frank Shorter in the late 1950s, early 60s, was one of the top 10 long distance runners in the United States. He didn't make the Olympic team, he wasn't that good, but he was one of the best. And he decided one time after 
long race, difficult, he was tired. I'm gonna take a vacation. I'm gonna take some time off of this stuff. And he and his friends decided they would just run for entertainment for a while. So they would get together as a group, go out in some very nice, easy, nice weather, and just jog. You know, their idea of a good time is to jog for 20 miles, okay? And while they were jogging, they would be talking and laughing and telling jokes. He did this for a year, no serious training. When he came back to racing, he was the best in the world. He made the Olympic team. He won the gold medal. Four years later, he repeated and won the silver medal in the marathon. He was nearly unbeatable. Long, slow distance became the form of training, coaxing, gently coaxing the body. From this idea, I think it is parallel to what um, researchers have found. It's called daily, regular writing. A major breakthrough. One researcher, a professor of counseling at New York State University, uh, discovered this. He did a study of junior professors. Uh, now, in academia, new professors, junior professors, the assistant professor level, have a lot of pressure. They have to get publications done in their first six years. They submit the portfolio, and then they get tenure, or they're fired. And if you don't get tenure in your first job, you are dead. It's over. You're never going to get a top job in a good university again. So the pressure is enormous on junior professors. He studied them and he found that they divided themselves into two groups. One group he called binge writers, B-I-N-G-E, binge writers. Binge writer says, for me to write, everything has to be perfect. I need quiet. I need at least five hours of complete and total quiet. Everything has to be silent. No traffic around my house. Call the airlines, tell them the airplanes can fly overhead. <laughs> and they never got tenure, none of them. They didn't get their work done. They were always behind on everything. When they finally got the five hours, they forgot what they were working on. They didn't know what they were doing anymore. So binge writing, this idea that I must have perfection, has never worked. No writers ever succeeded. The writers that have succeeded, that have done well, have all done daily, daily regular writing. And here's what that researcher found. Now, what they would do is take a certain amount of time every day, put it aside, and work and create a work for 40 minutes a day, two hours a day. It didn't matter how much time, as long as it was every day. They all got tenure. They all got their work done. They all were caught up with their students, their committee meetings, etc. Now, why does this work? Madeline Lego has explained it to us, famous science fiction author for children. Okay? Here's what she said. Inspiration does not come before writing. Inspiration is the result of writing. Wow. You don't walk around waiting for a new idea and then rush to the word processor. No, sit down. Even with no ideas, start writing, and writing will make you smarter. Stephen King said something very similar. He said, don't wait for the creative spirit. Don't wait for the muse. Just tell the muse you're going to be working from 7 until 10 o'clock, and the muse will come and visit you. This is extremely powerful. So the formula is this. Sit down and start to work. When you get stuck, take a little break. Then you go back. That's how new ideas come. Don't wander around. I'll tell you about my other career and how this has worked for me. Uh, I live in California, right? You know about California? We call it the altered state of California. Okay? And in California, it is a state law that you must be involved in show business. Did you know that? The police can call you over any time and say, let me see your script. Okay. <laughs> or where's your next audition? You know, everybody says show business. You go to a restaurant, and I'm not really a waiter. <coughs> I've got the script, you know, et cetera. So of course, I've been involved in show business. Uh, my show business career started about nine years ago 
And since that time, I have written nine plays. I really have musicals, and I've actually done it. And they've all been performed, all of them. And they've all been, I think, pretty successful. In fact, last time, there were more people in the audience than on the stage, which I think is really good. I've been, my successful career is limited to my synagogue. Uh, I write a play every year for my synagogue. I'm in a branch of Judaism that's quite liberal, called Reconstructionism. And in liberal synagogues, what you do every year is you write a play based on the Book of Esther, the New Testament, the Old Testament. For us, it's the Old Testament. Uh, and it's the story of Queen Esther and how she saved her people from, you know, this evil uh, Haman, et cetera, et cetera. So what we do is we, we base it on a different play or musical every year. One year it was all Beatles songs. Of course, last year we did it on Frozen. <laughs> My favorite song from Frozen, which I wrote, I'm so proud of it. In, in Judaism, if you want to do certain prayers, you need 10 Jews together. And it's called a minion. Okay, and what happens is if you want to do certain prayers, you got to find 10 Jews. So can, come on, join our minion. We need someone to stay here to do these prayers. So the song of, if you want to build a snowman, became, would you like to join our minion? Would you like to come and pray? We never see you anymore, et cetera. So here's what happens when I do this. This is my job, put this together, write the first draft anyway. Uh, I procrastinate. I, and around this time of year, I start worrying about it. Because this time of year, we're scheduling rehearsals for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the big holidays, and that's when the choir comes together, and that's when the cast comes together, because the choir is the cast of the play. And I start worrying about what are we gonna do, what are we gonna do? Then I remember Madeline Michael. Then I remember Stephen King, and I do what they tell me, and I remember Ernest Hemingway, very important. I sit down and start to write with no ideas. I got a vague idea, just a little bit so far, that's all. But I'm gonna sit down and start to write. I know what the characters are, I know what they have to do in the first scene, okay? That's all standard and given to me. Once I start sitting down to write, after procrastinating for weeks, the moment I start to write, it starts unfolding. Within three weeks, I have the first draft. And I tell myself, I'm only gonna write for 10 minutes, that's all. And I sit down and write for 20. I sit down and write for 30. The ideas keep coming. I'll tell you what happens then, because this, is, this goes back to revision. <clears throat> when I have the first draft, I give it to the director. The director is always the cantor at the synagogue. He's the singer of the synagogue, and he's responsible really for the spiritual aspect of the religion. So we sit down, we always go to the St. Denny's, and we sit down at Santa Monica. We go through the play. And one time when we finished, the couple on the next table applauded because we've been singing the whole day. So that was very nice. Anyway, uh, five hours left. Okay, we'll make it by midnight. Don't worry. Um, anyway, uh, he goes through it and he changes everything. Absolutely destroys it. Says, no, this is too long. This will never work. Because he has the visual sense. He has a show business background. And he can tell how it's going to look on the page. And whenever he says, we're going to do this here, that there, that's too long, the moment he says it, I realize he's right. I don't think I've ever disagreed with him. Okay? I mean, he's always been right. So he goes through it and chops it up. Then the cast starts rehearsing it, and they know the characters better than I do because they're all method actors. They get into the thing. They, they find the evil Haman inside of them and all this. And they make changes. And their changes are nearly always right. I get credit for all their changes, which is great. Okay? So all the best part was when so-and-so said that as well. Yeah, I didn't really write that, you know. Uh, but it's all a constant, constant revision all the time. And it's through revision, either yourself revising or having someone you really trust who also knows what you're working on that actually makes this happen. Writing makes you smarter. Okay, let me give you my review of everything I've tried to say so far. I've said reading is how we get writing stuff. In fact, I don't think we should ever test writing, ever. How do you like that? I'm about to save the world 
billions of dollars and billions of hours of torture. There is no reason to ever test writing. It's the most expensive, it's the most aggravating, nobody knows how to do it. Why bother? Because writing style comes from reading. You, you, you look at the scores on tests of reading and writing, they're always correlated. People who do better at reading do better at writing, why bother? So reading takes care of style, and you can't test the stuff I just told you. Composing process, those are strategies. You can learn the strategies in five minutes, but it takes years until you overcome what you learned in school, until you can actually do it, okay? So there's no reason to test writing. What a relief that's gonna be, okay? Uh, so writing style comes from reading. Actual writing itself is a valuable tool that we need to help students develop so they can use it the rest of their lives to solve problems. It can be done in the first language. It should be done in the first language. In bilingual programs for limited English proficient children, it should be done in Spanish, in my, in my opinion. But it can be actually practiced and done in any language class. You don't become a better writer by writing a lot. You become a better writer by reading and by using writing to try to solve problems won't give you better style, but it'll make you smarter. Okay, we have exactly 3.2 minutes for questions. Uh, once again, the first question needs to be friendly. I said that once at the University of California campus, and when I said that, three hands went down. <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, well, I, do, I, I agree with you. That's a good start. <laughs> I agree with you on, uh, I wish we didn't have to assess writing. That being said, how would you address the difference between teaching academic writing and creative writing? Okay. And creative. You can teach academic writing by reading academic stuff. It's the only way it can happen. This really hit me. I'll give you the anecdote first. Uh, I was on a research team when I was a graduate student trying to put together an article which we published on left-right brain differences. And I was the member of the team that read all the journal papers. The others put together all the equipment and the statistics and all that. When it came time to write the article, I was the one who could do it. They had no idea. Because when, when our professor said, change this to that, I knew he was right because I had seen all these things in print. There is no way to teach academic writing. None. It cannot happen. The system is too complicated. We haven't even described it. The way to do narrative writing, read lots of narrative stuff because you like it. And I do think we have no choice but to change the world. And let me subvert your question and talk about the politics. Here's how we do it. It's time for the revolutionary plan. Can I do my revolutionary plan first? Revolutionary plan. Here's how to change the world. The prerequisites for every revolutionary plan, number one, it involves no risk on your behalf, on your part. Fair enough? No time and no money. That's my revolutionary plan. Very simple. Number one, read. You don't have to read very much. Just a little, five minutes here and there. I recommend if we want to change education in America to read everything written by Susan Ohanian. O-H-A-N-I-A-N. Her husband wrote the book on Einstein. She wrote a book called Whatever Happened to Recess? Susan Ohanian, her major book, Whatever Happened to Recess, when they're eliminating recess so they can do test prep, that kind of stuff. I would read Alfie Kohn, A-L-F-I-E-K-O-H-M. I would read what they post. I would follow them on Twitter. Read a little bit each time. And part two, share it with your friends. That's the plan. You don't have to do anything more. So other people will find out that they're not the only ones. And you know, six degrees of separation, if we start sharing with our friends, in a few weeks the whole country will know. The problem is we think we're the only ones, but we're not connected to other people. So we have to get rid of this test and punish culture that is destroying everything. Okay, question here. Suggest that we spend at reading, and another is um, you did mention that um, how to choose books. Or, um, but my question is, when we are reading, um, how to do the notes? Or I mean, should we take notes 
How much reading? Teachers know more than anybody. No outside expert like me can tell a teacher how much time kids can read. So if you're teaching a fifth grade class and you're experienced, you know the children, you can know, well, let's try five minutes, let's try 10 minutes, see how it goes, always a little bit less. It's the teacher's call, not from the administration. Number two, should we take notes? If it's free voluntary reading, it's up to you. It's up to the student. Mostly, no. I know what you do. I know what I do. We do the same thing. We don't take notes. Except we see something amazing. We sometimes want to know where it is so we can find it again. Okay, my question is for um, teachers. Yeah. yeah. Your question for teachers, not for our. Should students take notes? Not no, for, for our teachers. I mean, when we read. It's up to you. It's up to you. It's that we evolve our own note taking system. I cannot leave the house without a notebook because you'll forget your great idea. So I think it's very important to have a notebook with you at all times that you can put in your pocket. Wallace tells the story of the great of the man who had such a wonderful discovery, a wonderful idea. He sank to his knees to thank God and then he got up and forgot the idea. <laughs> this happened. Good new ideas are very fragile. So it's extremely important to keep a notebook always. Regularly, every day I fill out maybe three or four pages. When last night we were invited to dinner, I had my notebook. You know, I can't go anywhere without it. So, great question. Thank you. Yes? Just a burning curiosity. How many times have you published? Me? Yes. Uh, let's see. <laughs> I have published, who's counting? I think uh, a little under 500 articles. And I've been doing this a long time. Yeah, I've been doing this since the early 70s. My first paper was in 1971, before your mother was born. Okay, uh, that was the first time. And I gotta tell you too that I got lucky early on and made a, an interesting discovery, <clears throat> and that just opened up all kinds of possibilities. There's another point, I'm gonna subvert your question and answer a scientific question that you did not answer, but I'll pretend you did. <laughs> a small percentage of my work are original experiments. I'd say I've published maybe 50 original studies where I've actually done pre-test, post-test, all this stuff. Most of the discoveries, most of the things I've published are reanalyses of older ideas, of old publications, or looking at lots of literature and coming to different conclusions. It's called secondary analysis or meta-analysis. And if you look at the history of science, this is where you get breakthroughs. It's rarely a single study that does it. It's an observation. Einstein did only secondary and meta-analysis. His big breakthroughs were secondary reanalysis of papers done 30 years before. So I do a lot of that, and that is a secret of success. Brother Marsani. Electronic copies or hard copies? Yes. The answer is yes, electronic or hard. Uh, well, uh, this, I'll, I'll divide that into two questions. One has to do with books and pleasure reading, and the other with scientific papers. With books and pleasure reading, um, the e-book uh, revolution has kind of peaked, you know about this, where everybody was Kindleization, everything was going to be Kindle, 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 and everybody got Kindles, and now it's kind of, you know, eased off a little bit. Kindles are fine. The problem with Kindles is that they're too expensive. <laughs> Look at it this way. The problem we have with literacy is that poor children do not have access to books. They don't have them at home. They don't have school libraries. Uh, and books and bookstores are too expensive. And there aren't that many in poor neighborhoods. Kindles could solve it if they were cheap. People with Kindles now, and this is from the Pew Foundation, they reported on this, the people who have Kindles are middle class. They're people who make $75,000 a year or more. Because a Kindle is going to cost you $80 to $100. And the Kindle books are just as expensive as print books. So what's going on here? If they make Kindles $5 and a book 50 cents, I would be their biggest advocate. Because then we could have it all through India. We could have it all through China. We could have it in every high poverty neighborhood in the world. That's the promise of Kindles, and they're getting better all the time. I prefer books, but I know it's a question of taste.
it's no big deal. A lot of people like Gibbles and they're good and they're getting better all the time. In terms of science, there has been a major change that is your business. Uh, I'll tell you my story on this, what happened to me, the overnight change in my thinking. I was invited to write a, a paper in an edited uh, collection on input, it's called Input Matters. And I wrote a big, long paper, I usually write short papers, but I wrote this big, long paper, I was really proud of it. I pumped everything in the current state of the comprehension hypothesis. And I brought in first language, second language, foreign language, uh, first language, literacy, I had a section on animal language, and I had a section, what can we expect when the aliens land from uh, Zeta Reticula and Alpha Centauri, you know, et cetera. And I had, I had all that in the article. The book came out, it sold for $160 hardcover. A uh, soft cover was a bargain of, I think, maybe five, something like that. And I looked at what books were costing. They're all like that, with a few exceptions. In fact, the company that did my book, I, I won't mention their name, Multilingual Matters, uh, <laughs> had a book called Education and Poverty, $160. The irony was lost on them, okay? So it's just too expensive. You look at the journals, I look at my Schedule C and my income tax. I spend thousands of dollars every year on journals. I can't afford it anymore for long, dense articles that nobody can read and understand anyway. Everything has changed. Now it's going to be open access journals. It's going to be free journals. All academic research should be available to every citizen, free of charge. I hope that the companies go out of business and get some honest way of making a living. We don't need this. The revolution started in mathematics. A winner of a major uh, award in math, equivalent to the Nobel Prize, revolted against the math journals, and he said, I don't do this anymore. We write the articles, we revise them, all you guys do is publish them, and you charge big money, and we get nothing. So he said, no more, it's all gonna be open access. A thousand mathematicians, professors, signed the petition, including, big applause, my son. All right, yes. Okay. The next step in the revolution was Karen Rowan, our organizer today. And had this great idea. We have, we have the first open access journal in second language acquisition, the International Journal of Foreign Language Teaching, IJFLT.com. You are subscribers. There have been a couple of more. There's more and more. The world of, it, of math has caught on to this. They're doing it. The world of education has been slower. Uh, professors don't get full credit all the time. They'd like you to publish in these prestige journals, etc. But it's only a matter of time. Things are changing rapidly in all areas of inquiry, it's all gonna be for free. A lot of people have done what I've done, and that is put everything on the website. If you go to sdcrashin.com, I have as many of my articles as I have time to post all the time, and this has been very good. People can't afford the journals. I can't, if I can't afford them, most people can't afford them. The articles are too long, they're too boring, so we want free articles that are short, easy to understand. So that's been the revolution. Okay, folks, we got to get on. We've got more stuff to do today. Thank you very much.